Okay, good. Thank you very much for being here with us today, uh, talking in the framework of the Smart City Expo and Congress about the urban innovation areas and defining the economic growth. This uh, roundtable is talking about economy and cities. This roundtable is about smart cities and knowledge cities. This uh, roundtable is about hard factors and soft factors for economic development. And when we talk about cities, usually we talk about uh, a place where the people is living and the people is working. And why the city now can be the platform of the knowledge-based economy? Because at the end of the day, the cities are the platform of the talent, the real raw material of this knowledge-based economy. But talent is looking for a place for working and living. It's looking for a place for developing an activity in terms of economic activity and a professional activity, but also is looking for a place where they can combine the professional life and the personal life. When we talk about the smart cities, usually we talk about the transformation of the water, energy, waste, uh, mobility, and information systems. It means the Internet of Things, Internet is impacting in the way that we manage the day by day of the city. But cities also has the opportunity to take advantage of the innovators, of the entrepreneurs, people that can really improve the way that we manage the cities. That's the way that we'll see today uh, in our panel, different people that is working in all over the world, in China, in Tel Aviv, in Brazil, and also in the USA, making economy around cities. But let me tell you that we have here two approaches. The first one is how can we use the technology in order to improve the cities, the services of the cities, and how can we develop economy and entrepreneurs around this application? The city is a goal of innovation, but also the city is a platform of innovation. At the end of the day, if we have fiber to the home, fiber to the offices, and we are promoting the media sector, the people can live in our cities and can sell the video games or can sell uh, any content to the world. That's the two approaches of the city. The city is a platform of the knowledge-based economy, and the city is a goal of innovation. Today, we have this opportunity to listen to very practical activities. And let me thank you all the panelists to be here today in Barcelona. And we will start with Mr. Zan. First, let me thank you, uh, the opportunity to listen to you, and also thank you because you are not very well in terms of uh, your uh, health, but you uh, wanted to be here with us, and we will allow you to leave when you will finish your presentation. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> thank you very much for the introduction. I'm very glad to have the opportunity here to give a very brief introduction of what happened in Pudong of Shanghai City uh, in past five years. Uh, we have a uh, what happened? Yeah, maybe you can find that the my position and uh, uh, the co commission I'm working with is uh, different from uh, the that one. This means this is because uh, five uh, months ago the two commissions, science commission and uh, uh, information commission, uh, information economy commission was involved in one department in the local government. So now. Uh, I say I'm a vice executive and chief information officer of technology and the economy commission. Maybe this uh, com uh, th this commission is more 
uh, close to the topic of today, I think. So maybe uh, most people have not uh, the chance to uh, visit Shanghai and Pudong, so I give a very, very smooth uh, introduction. Where is Pudong? Maybe now you can, here is uh, Barcelona, and here's uh, Shanghai. And uh, uh, also this, this is the map of China, and uh, here is Shanghai city. And the Pudong New Area, New Area District is uh, uh, at the coast uh, east coast of Pacific. So let me see, I will show you that what happened to Pudong in past five years. So maybe you can find in past five, five years, Pudong just look like a farmland uh, in the upslide. And uh, now, Pudong has become a modern metropolitan area of Shanghai. So maybe this is uh, some highlights of a Pudong New Area District, the Lu Jiazui uh, Financial and Trade uh, Economy Zone. And here is the Air Pudong Airport. And this is the World Expo uh, 2010, the Chinese uh, Pavilion. And uh, here is a, a, a deep uh, harbor. Uh, is also the first harbor of China. And also, this is uh, other uh, areas of the Pudong area district. And this is the village of Pudong. So uh, in the past five years, uh, Pudong has been, uh, has very, very rapid growth in economy, about 100 per, uh, times. Now, this is uh, something about Pudong. We have uh, uh, about 2,000, uh, this is some people and uh, uh, the pollution of the people. This is the, uh, the, the, the land uh, average of uh, Pudong. But as the growth, the rapid development of a Pudong area district, some uh, problem has been faced by us, for example, the environmental pollu pollution, the traffic jam, and uh, these things. And a lot of people around in the different areas. So we have, we have had the uh, best choice to uh, make the pro the, this pro pro problem solved. What's the way? We think the smart city is the best way for Pudong. So maybe this is the, 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 the line, uh, the development line of a smart city from 2009 and now. We, something, some different uh, things happened in the different years. And also, uh, we, uh, in five years ago, Pudong New Area, New Area District uh, published uh, established index system in China. We showed the smart city 1.0. And now, in the, in the past five years, we put much efforts according to the smart city 1.0 to do a lot of things in Pudong. For example, this is the e-government cloud war. I would like to say, not is not uh, e-government, but uh, government cloud. So now in Pudong, we have government cloud instead of e-government, because uh, it's a total different. The the the, the, the G cloud is totally different from e-government because e-government is just some application of elect e electric uh, technology, but the G Cloud, we have uh, integrated the information, the intelligence, and uh, integration of different systems as one platform to support the, the normal uh, behaviors, performance of the government. So we use the G 
cloud instead of e-government. Uh, this is something uh, we, we, the energy exhausting uh, map of different uh, buildings. And uh, this is the environmental monitoring. We put a lot of uh, monitors in different buildings and different areas to, uh, uh, to monitor the factors of environmental elements. And we also have our uh, iPodon free Wi-Fi cover the world areas of Pudong new area districts. And we also have a smart bus smart tourism uh, uh, solutions, and, smart, uh, and the data analysis of uh, smart tourism. Now, I would like to say this is something happened before, and uh, in the future, what will we do in the future? Big data is the first choice for us. And uh, the IoT is also uh, the, another aspect of uh, the smart city in five years, in, in the future of five years. And uh, cloud computing now is uh, deeply involved in the governmental work and uh, the development of economy and uh, society. And the information security is also very important for us. Also included the green transport, home security, and uh, so a green, ec ecological, and uh, livable city is the within the five years in the future, I think. So we from the uh, exhibition uh, outside, we can find a lot of uh, can, technology and products is involved in the uh, future application of a smart city. So, Pudong is a better future. So, we would like to have the opportunity to invite all of the people to visit China, to visit Shanghai, and to visit Pudong. So, you will find that in the Pudong is a very amazing place in in China, uh, uh, even in the world. So to choose Pudong, to choose success. Thank you. Very good, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Zhang. And thank you because you were sharing with us uh, your strategy and also your actions and how are you using the technology like big data, IoT, cloud security, and also the application. But your message is clear. It's not only a place for uh, that you are applying technology, it's a place that you want to improve the quality of the life of the people that is living there, that at the end of the day is the, the talent, the people, the, the people that will choose to live in your city. And we will accept your invitation. We will go all to Pudong, if you don't mind. And, uh, but let, you, let me tell you that you have to uh, buy a, an airplane to go together, okay? <laughs> Good, thank you very much. Okay, the next speaker, if you want, uh, you can leave and uh, uh, I have to feel say, uh, I'm sorry because uh, my hair has some problems. So now I have to leave here and uh, uh, hope more opportunity to uh, uh, chat with. Okay. Thank you. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay, now uh, we fly from Pudong to uh, Tel Aviv. And I would like to offer the floor to Mr. Eitan, he's from Tel Aviv Global. Uh, Tel Aviv Global is a, is a government agency that is managing the ecosystem of innovation and entrepreneurship of Tel Aviv. And uh, we would like to know how you are improving and promoting the innovation and entrepreneurship in your city. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joseph. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Eitan Schwartz. I am the CEO of Tel Aviv Global, which is the uh, city agency in charge of internationalizing our ecosystem, how to bring benefit to the city from our amazing startup ecosystem. So I want to share with you in the next few minutes something about our city and our main challenges um, that we are tackling. Uh, Tel Aviv is a very small city. It's about the size of one building in Pudong. Uh, as you can see in comparison to other major European cities. Um, and nonetheless, what happened over the past few years, it is one of the most amazing startup ecosystems in the world. If we have one single asset in terms of our economic development, which makes us unique, it is this. 
we have more startups per capita or per square kilometer than any other city in the world. Um, at any given moment, we're talking about around 1,500 technological startups, which is about one-third of what's happening in Israel, which is known as the startup nation. Um, as I said, the density of the creativity of the city is what makes it unique. Um, some major names that you might know that came out of Tel Aviv in the past few years. Um, and of course, the issue of this impact on our economy. Um, about 50,000 people work in the high-tech sector in Tel Aviv or in related industries. There are 400,000 people living in the city. So 50,000 employees in a city of 400,000 is a huge volume. And the numbers of the exits of Israeli companies is constantly growing. Another interesting phenomenon about the city, it is not only the highest concentration of startup companies, it has the highest concentration of technological accelerators in Europe. So what this means is Tel Aviv, we think of Tel Aviv as a sort of a microwave oven. Instead of heating up your company for a few years, you put it in the microwave in Tel Aviv and it comes out somewhat more mature after a shorter period of time. That's where we excel and we see high numbers and growing numbers majorly, mainly over the past two years. Um, if you read this phenomenal book about the startup nation, it gives you the reasons why this is happening. It's not the water that we drink. It's a combination of attributes of Israel being a, an extremely small country that can't really develop real industry of itself, uh, no real trade partners in the vicinity. Uh, in essence, it's a small island. We have no natural resources. We have a tradition rooted in our, uh, in our nation of learning and of asking questions. We all go to the army, so that produces a lot of people with very highly technological skills. And we're an immigrant society, um, and that is, those are the secrets of why Israel is very technological, and that is the reason why the startup industry concentrates in Tel Aviv, which is, uh, if you will, one of the most important cities in Israel. So we have a great ecosystem, and here's the challenge. One is, what do we do to keep the Israelis in the country while they're being offered a lot of money to go anywhere else in the world? And even more importantly, what do we do to bring people from outside into Israel? Because if it's hard to keep the Israelis in the country, bringing people into Israel is not only hard, it's almost illegal. It is very hard in our legal system for non-Israelis to work, and one of our major challenges is, how do we create economic benefit for the city when one of the major things of our work is almost impossible in our economy? So I'll talk about our strategy, which has four pillars. The first one deals with how do we support our local ecosystem? How do we make sure that those 1,400 or those 1,500 companies and their employees are very, very happy with their life in the city? And then what do we do to promote the income of foreign talent into a country where our immigration laws and our labor laws are very, very unique. So I'll talk about the support of the ecosystem. Um, these are measures that you find in a lot of cities around the world. Uh, the major thing is municipal tax breaks for startup companies. We give up money so that these startup companies feel at home. Um, we're looking towards making Tel Aviv more and more of a beta site for applications and for technology. So if you want something to use in the public sphere, it will become more and more easy. We have a lot of public co-working spaces that the city sponsors. Um, we founded very recently a committee where it's, which meets once a month with all the people in City Hall that deal with innovation. And if you're a startup entrepreneur, you come to us once a month and you say, this is what I want. I want data. I want access to a municipal expert. I want to use my application and test it in the public sphere. I might want advice. I might want money. And we streamline those requests in a way that makes this community better and more efficient and happy with City Hall. There are a lot of events in the cities. There are a lot of meet meetups in the cities, a lot of conferences in the cities. So what goes on is a very, very, very active, dynamic, creative ecosystem. We're working with our government to create a national startup visa, something that is really in the early stages of birth so that people that want to work in Israel and are not Israeli will be able to do so. We see if there's one issue where we see a huge presence of international companies and, um, and organs in Tel Aviv specifically and in Israel, it's multinationals opening their R&D centers in Israel or multinationals moving their R&D centers to Israel. So tapping into the local talent and then using the products for a multinational and here are some of the examples. And if you ask us where is the future of the city, it's in attracting more and more multinationals that will use local Israeli talent. 
And finally, what we call the one day to three months. Essentially, it's legal to be in Israel right now up until three months if you're not an Israeli, and then it becomes a bit more complicated. But we see a huge growth in everything that has to do with that segment, whether it's conferences, acceleration programs, training programs, incubators. The growth we've seen in incubators over the past two years has a lot to do with these international people coming for short periods of time, setting up shop in one of these uh, 84 accelerators, and then after three months or after six months, they're in a bit more mature process and position to be to exit the market. Do I have one more minute, Joseph? Yes. One more minute. Yeah. Um, now I'll do a shameless promotion of my city because this is something we're very proud of. And two years ago in this conference, we won the Smartest City in the World Award uh, in Barcelona. We're not the smartest city in the world. There are a lot of wonderfully smart cities. But this is something that was invented in-house in the municipality and we're very proud of. Essentially, it's a way to bring together the amazing talent we have in the city and the amazing city we have to a service that will essentially transform the city uh, in terms of its digital services. Uh, the municipality underwent a digital transformation in the past few years. Um, and the reason we won this award two years ago is we came up with a service that allows us to civically engage our population in a very efficient and a very, at the end of the day, cheap manner. Um, we collect data from our citizens, which they give us voluntarily. And in return, we serve them with information and with benefits and with knowledge that they want to know about what's going on in the city. So imagine that you are in your community center in Tel Aviv and you fill out a form about your habits, about your preferences, about what you want to know, about what type of cultural events you're interested in. And then once a day, you'll receive a text message from the city with the following messages. Tomorrow, your road will be blocked because of construction. Today, there's a performance for kids, and we know you have kids, so it's for free. Uh, the day after tomorrow, we're doing a uh, public budgeting project. You get to vote where the money will be spent in your local park. So we give you only the information that you want to know and only the information you need to know based on your preferences. We collect this information from the citizens, and we have 300 employees in City Hall that, in addition to their job, are constantly feeding information into a central system that then knows how to intercept the different citizens. It's a very effective way of communicating with our citizens um, on a kind of like on a, on a, on a two-sided route. So you're welcome to come to the Tel Aviv Pavilion and check out this product, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Etan. Uh, really, uh, after the visit to Pudong, we can come back and go to Tel Aviv. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, very, very interesting, the approach that you told about the connection of this e ecosystem of innovation between new startups and also attracting big corporations, but the research development and I understand the innovation. They see that the source of innovation are the entrepreneurs, and the way to attract companies to the cities is not just because you are giving land, it's because you have an ecosystem of innovation, plenty of new activities. Remember that you have now the opportunity to send our, the message to the, uh, to the panel in order to questions and answers at the end of our uh, presentation. It means that you can take advantage now because uh, you have a, a, that he, a land here. It means that you can really ask whatever you want. Okay, let's go to Recife. Uh, let's go to uh, Brazil and, and let, let me take advantage of Kev Gama, he's professor at uh, TESAR, please, uh, and uh, on the Universidad Federal de Pernambuco. It's a wonderful place because that's also the place of Recife Porto Digital. Is one of our, the reference in terms of how can you transform an old district in an industrial district, but knowledge-based industrial district, it means the IT district. Taking advantage of this transformation, uh, Recife was developing this district that is a reference because they are developing jobs based on IT. It means that it's not only that IT is transforming your district, it's also that IT is transforming your economy because you can offer the people to work internationally. Okay, Kev, whenever you want. Thank you, Joseph. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. So, uh, by the way, our head of the uh, uh, Porto Digital, which is the tech hub, uh, is uh, up just to, if you uh, up just to here? be sure that Chico Savoy is here. Okay, good, perfect. Well, uh, so uh, thanks for the introduction. I'll be uh, telling you a, a story, a context, uh, and uh, also a story 
that's uh, going on uh, in the scene uh, in Recife. There are many stories, so I'm going to tell you this one. Uh, just to give you a context, uh, over there, there's the map of uh, Brazil. When we see uh, the spot there, uh, Recife is in the northeast area. And this is a uh, aerial view of the uh, Porto Digital, which was uh, mentioned by Joseph. It's the tech hub that was founded by in a uh, partnership of the uh, university and the local government. So uh, my uh, colleagues uh, from the university were the f uh, founders of a uh, research institute called CESAR, which is now, uh, which now I'm an associate. The, uh, the and then a few years uh, after that, uh, they created uh, this initiative of Porto Digital to avoid the brain drain. So there was many people uh, going to other cities to find jobs. So we were uh, trying to foster a new market. So we're, we've been trying and we've been uh, sort of uh, successful in that, but there's a lot of things uh, to do. So uh, in the tech hub, uh, in the uh, third world city, it's uh, a not uh, very uh, current uh, ter uh, terminology being used, but uh, I consider that we're still uh, under development and, uh, and now we're going to, into a lot of trouble if you heard the news. Uh, about the Brazilian economy, but we are a country of contrast, and it's really complicated to be uh, smart, 100% technological, because we have a lot of contrast. Uh, this is a picture of a uh, nice neighborhood uh, in front of the sea, and this is the picture behind this uh, same uh, neighborhood, and we see a slum, which is still there, and this is really difficult for us, uh, not to think about social things, but we started with technology and sometimes we try to uh, focus on these people, but it, it's really hard. That there, There's a huge abyss, uh, uh, there's a huge gap. So we started, uh, well, part of this uh, Smart City initiative I'm talking about here, there, there are others, uh, but the one I'm involved is uh, centered on uh, open data. And we had a uh, start uh, focused on opening the data of the city and we wanted to make it known. So we wanted people to develop inno innovative applications focused on um, data that was uh, supposed to be public. So uh, we got a good um, start. Our first goal, which was make this uh, open data portal to be known, uh, was achieved. And we had a uh, sort of a midterm uh, contest, which, uh, which lasted for about uh, three months, I think. And we got prizes uh, uh, given to the, uh, the applicants of the participants. And also we, we held hackathons. Uh, the first hackathon was held inside Campus Party, which is a huge geek party, where people uh, stay uh, camping inside a huge uh, um, convention center like this one. And they were developing applications in exchange of a prize. Uh, the applications had to use this, um, this open data portal, the data that was held in the portal. And it was the first partnership uh, which were with these uh, institutions. And as I said, we achieved this goal, but uh, there was a huge problem. This is a problem with hackathons all over the world. So we create initiatives focused on data. Uh, the other talk that was, uh, was here, uh, they were mentioning the importance of data. It is really important, but actually we need problems uh, to see how we can use that data to solve a certain problem. So the focus was on the data, not on the problem, so the apps were, were not very useful. They were interesting for like a showcase, but they were not that interesting. Uh, there, was no, there, there were no businesses being formed. The, the, the city was not able, because of law limitations, uh, to hire the, the winners. And uh, these solutions were biased by the uh, participants, so it, it was not focused actually on the citizen. And we saw a natural shift, for instance, in New York, there is this uh, huge uh, contest uh, uh, called New York, uh, New York City uh, Big Apps, and they also face the same problem uh, with uh, no uh, startups being uh, formed after the, these, uh, this contest. Uh, and then they shifted to uh, focus on a certain problem. So we tried that, inspired on this uh, living lab methodology, which is uh, 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 a bit uh, broad, the, the, this concept. And we uh, formed another partnership to uh, this uh, uh, hackathon that would be centered on citizen problems. The idea was to go after the problems, to uh, talk to people, but it was hard to, to make because these uh, participants, the developers that were participating on this uh, hackathon, they were inside this convention center, we couldn't take them uh, to go to the, the city and see the problems and, and see by themselves. So we uh, talked to people in the uh, mayorship, 
so, uh, from different secretaries and uh, different departments. So they, uh, using a design technique, they created personas which had, uh, who had these, these problems. So we tried to focus on these uh, problems. We have different categories of problems. Uh, we found that the solutions were much more creative than uh, uh, the previous uh, editions, the two previous editions. But still, we had the same problem. The project were abandoned. After the prize, so the team uh, wa was going to split up, and uh, this, the, we saw that this model was not enough. This is not a problem from Recife. This is a problem worldwide with hackathons. I've been doing research uh, for uh, the last six months, uh, uh, collecting data on that, and it is a huge problem uh, everywhere. So it's hard to see the things that keep up. So. Uh, we uh, insisted, on, insisted on this error, but trying to uh, fix uh, some issues like uh, focusing on problems. So we moved to, uh, toward uh, live data. So we got uh, data feeds from the uh, local transportation company. And uh, based on the mixture of uh, backgrounds, we had uh, designers, uh, developers, uh, people from uh, public administration, and uh, other, uh, other uh, professions and uh, with different backgrounds. So uh, the first prize of, of this other hackathon that well, was, is not officially uh, held by the uh, City Hall, but it was a partnership uh, with uh, many cities uh, from Europe, so uh, people from Portugal organized that. So Hacker City was held in one of the units of uh, Porto Digital uh, in the accelerate, uh, accelerator uh, uh, unit. And uh, we had that over uh, oh, Almost 24 hours, people were developing uh, applications, and the first one that won was based on feminism, was uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, report sexual assaults inside buses, and uh, uh, would pinpointing the bus that was uh, having that, that, that problem. And uh, on the same uh, uh, fashion, we used uh, live data, uh, well, producing data for the data portal using the uh, Internet of Things. And uh, the last edition of this Hacker City Down, which is the official uh, uh, City Hall uh, hackathon, we created uh, another type of contest where uh, participants would propose hardware for collecting data and publishing that data in the open data portal. So uh, there was a company, uh, this time that was investing in, uh, in the prizes, and they were interested in the teams. Uh, not exactly in the projects, but now we wanted to uh, uh, leverage the uh, results uh, to potential businesses. So uh, the company was interested in the teams, but not in the project, So because the team was capable of producing a nice result in a short period of time. And uh, this uh, methodology, like uh, uh, I was mentioning before, the Living Lab is the idea to uh, go after people and uh, to uh, mix uh, different backgrounds uh, from uh, different uh, areas and try to see with the different, uh, different uh, sites uh, this, uh, how to solve uh, urban problems. So uh, in this fashion, uh, Cesar had a summer job where uh, students would go after problems. Uh, I was a tutor of one of the uh, groups, and uh, in the beginning of this uh, year, they went after uh, people with problems in the streets. So one thing that uh, they wanted to uh, focus was uh, the collection of recyclables uh, in the city. So the reality is that these people, these uh, cart haulers, are the ones that collect uh, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, recyclables. So they went to the cooperatives that uh, uh, they had uh, these people uh, uh, bringing the, uh, the recyclables, and they saw a way to uh, use technology to provide a solution to help them. So uh, they created a uh, mobile phone application, which is not the reality for this sort of people. They don't use this sort of technology, but they were really interested and they found it useful. So you can uh, uh, tell that you have recyclables, so can they go after you. They don't have, they, they're gonna optimize their, their, their routes so they don't have to walk all over and not get not that many uh, uh, amounts of uh, uh, things that to, to collect. So uh, this is uh, looking for funding, so we couldn't continue, we couldn't keep up. It was an interesting uh, result, but we, we uh, didn't have funding to continue that. Um, and uh, another type of uh, innovation focused on the citizen was uh, this uh, new format, which was innovative in the way that it was hired with public money. Uh, it was uh, used in a way that uh, there was no deliverable, in a sense that was uh, tangible, which is difficult for the government to uh, do procurement on that. It was a process for making people to contribute and they, the citizens would create that. So 50 people uh, were, well, there were workshops with uh, 
few uh, uh, tens of people, so like 200 people uh, participated in the first workshop, and then they uh, uh, subscribed to be selected for the uh, workshops that would uh, create this uh, project. So seven projects were selected, and this uh, Playtown uh, uh, project, and uh, they uh, are going to be, uh, uh, they're being developed, so uh, public furniture, for instance, are going to be uh, provided in the uh, old town of uh, Recife, and uh, these projects uh, are prototypes. So these companies, oh, these people could create companies, but this first phase is of a phase of prototype, and there's going to be a second phase where another company is going to be hired to actually uh, develop these, uh, this project. But this could be another opportunity to generate this um, innovation by citizens that could uh, uh, foster the uh, local ecosystem focused on the city, not just uh, companies, but fostering the creation of companies. So a main difficulty is that uh, we don't have any format to uh, actually uh, develop that. It's, it's a, a huge uh, uh, complication with the, the dependency on the uh, government, the local government is really hard. So for instance, uh, in our roadmap, we, have, uh, we had an idea of a city incubator that was being discussed with the current Secretary of Innovation. So due to politics, she had to leave the, uh, uh, the position and the person that replaced her had a different agenda. So this, is, this was put aside. And then we had a new election for the mayor. Uh, the, the same mayor is gonna continue. I don't know if this agenda is gonna be uh, changed, but uh, it's really hard to uh, depend on, uh, on local government. I don't know if Everyone has this problem in their, uh, in their cities, but uh, the commitment for uh, midterm and, uh, and long-term projects, it's, uh, it's really hard to find. So uh, there are different strategies, uh, like uh, Porto Digital was to be independent of uh, this, uh, well, par partly independent of this uh, public uh, initiative, but it's, it's a hard time. So I see it as a, as a temporary failure. So we're gonna be uh, continuing to see if we can create incubators or a infrastructure to hire projects, uh, open calls where the city could uh, foster the development of these ideas, and then these uh, uh, companies that are being uh, formed, these startups that are being formed can continue. Uh, the examples that uh, we would like to follow is uh, at least uh, currently we are observing is uh, initiatives from San Francisco and Amsterdam, which is a sort of an extension of this initiative, uh, uh, initiative from San Francisco, which is an open call from the city hall uh, for uh, startups focused on actual problems. So instead of an open uh, uh, hackathon where, where people are gonna be developing things for a few days or a few weeks, uh, in this uh, sense, uh, for a few months, Companies are being uh, incubated, and then uh, they're going to have mentoring, and then they'll go uh, sell their things uh, to the market. So some of these strategies uh, partially uh, depend on uh, public funding, but uh, they try to provide infrastructure uh, for these uh, ideas to, to uh, flourish. So this is uh, the message I wanted to share with you. Uh, I would love to have uh, insights, ideas, and discuss with you uh, in a later time. So thanks for your attention. This is uh, well, well, what I had to say to you. Thank you. <laughs> Muito obrigado. Thank you very much, Kiev. Really very interesting. The key idea behind all of that is in order to start innovation, you have to look for what's the real challenge. Don't start innovation if you don't know what you want to solve, because if not, you have a solution and you will try to find who has the problem. This is a very uh, basic approach, but when you put the challenge of the city or challenge of the citizens, uh, in order to promote that people can really solve this challenge, you are creating a really an ecosystem of innovation connecting the challenge with the solutions. Okay, uh, from Brazil to New York, New York, New York. Uh, I am not going to sing, but, in a, <laughs> uh, but uh, David, uh, welcome uh, to the Smart City Expo. Now we go to New York in order to know more about what you're doing with your new lab, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, uh, I'm here as the uh, co-founder and CEO of New Lab. It's a project in the Brooklyn Navy Yard, uh, which is in uh, Brooklyn, uh, just across from Manhattan. Uh, as you can see on this map, uh, we're very, very close to Manhattan. We are uh, right between the Williamsburg Bridge and the Manhattan Bridge. And the Navy Yard is this campus of about 300 acres. Uh, at its high point, 70,000 people work there, 
and it's at its low point, uh, about 2,000 people work there. Uh, as many of you have probably heard, New York City is very expensive, and if you're competing with residential real estate and you want to do something innovative, you really don't stand much of a chance. So uh, the Navy Yard is an interesting opportunity because they're looking for projects that help spawn what they're calling new manufacturing, and that's what we set up New Lab to do. Uh, the building that we took over was built in 1902. This is a picture of it in its heyday. It built most of the ships that were used in World War I and World War II. It was this incredible cathedral of manufacturing. And in 2011, uh, the day I walked into it, it looked like this. Uh, so there was the guy showing me around. I asked him to stand in the middle of the building for scale. And it was this rusted old hull of a building but I really thought for New York City, it was just one of the most amazing opportunities there was to see space like this that, that was raw and available to uh, recondition. So we just opened this year in 2016. Uh, this is what it looks like today. Uh, we have uh, 84,000 square feet or 8,400 square meters. Uh, these are some of the uh, different areas. We have everything from companies taking sometimes 5,000 square feet to companies just taking a few desks. Uh, we have, we're a public-private partnership. Uh, we had support from the city, from the state, from the Economic Development Corporation, uh, and from a lot of other corporations who wanted to support the project. Um, all of the companies that we're working with in New Lab all are working in robotics, AI, connected devices, um, uh, nano, and healthcare. Um, and uh, so we're really very hardware-centric community. We're also an urban tech hub. So uh, just as was discussed here, if people are working on projects or companies specifically in hardware or products that make the city better, uh, New Lab is a place for them to work directly with commissioners and other stakeholders to help make their products better and actually serve a need. The other thing I should mention is we're not an accelerator. So all of our companies have some level of funding. Uh, they're not brand new startups. We, we take companies that come out of other accelerators. Uh, so some of the projects that you're seeing here uh, on the top is a pipe crawling robot made by Honeybee Robotics, which is one of our members. It's a little robot that can go into um, infrastructure and tell you when the pipe's going to fail. It has sensors and cameras and does a complete uh, 360 survey of a pipe. We also have um, a company that makes uh, solar arrays for everything from backpacks to wearable technology. And that little green thing in the corner is a co company called um, uh, farm shelf that makes deployable uh, hydroponic farms for schools or places that uh, suffer from not having enough fruits and vegetables. Uh, we see ourselves right in the middle of hardware and software and right between entrepreneur and enterprise. Uh, we're building a uh, corporate program. We're already working with IBM, with GE, and a number of other corporates. And some of the companies that we have at New Lab, just to go very briefly, are Honeybee Robotics. Uh, they make robotics for everything from the Mars rover to medical robots. Uh, Strongarm Tech, which makes exoskeletons for the industrial athlete. Nanotronics Imaging, which makes a, uh, the world's best nano microscope. Uh, Waverly Labs, which makes a universal translator. So it's like on Star Trek. You could wear one, I could wear one. We could speak two different languages and communicate. That's a mixture of a hardware product and an artificial intelligence product. Um, and then we have Cold Steel Laser, which makes a surgical scalpel. Uh, as of today, uh, we have, uh, our companies have raised um, over $141 million. We've had a beta space for 18 months. We just moved into this big building uh, in, in, in June. Um, and in aggregate, our members have uh, a market value of about half a billion dollars. And we've already had acquisitions and exits of over $100 million. So uh, as a small community and just one of these many tech hubs in New York City, uh, we've had a pretty uh, great track record so far. Uh, so far, uh, we have had 340 uh, companies apply, uh, and we've only accepted about 17% of them, and we're about 70% full. So we have over 300 people working there. We will be at about 400 people when full. Uh, we have, uh, I believe, uh, 47 companies there right now. And as I said, we've had 342 companies apply. So it's been really in demand. And one of the reasons that it's in demand 
is that we have really amazing facilities on site. So you can take something from a napkin sketch to a full working prototype at New Lab. We have everything from digital manufacturing, CNC mills, uh, digital lathe, wood shops, metal shops, six different types of 3D printers. And more important than the machines, we have uh, companies who have provided the equipment coming to train uh, our members and also our staff. We also have a product realization staff. And so when we think about our community, uh, you can see the icons at the bottom of the companies that are, are found within New Lab. And uh, we're trying to stay very uh, true to uh, those verticals. But we have sort of a three rings uh, of our community. The center ring is the companies that live and work within New Lab. Uh, this, the middle ring are um, conveners and people who help create projects. And then the outer ring are corporations uh, who are working with us on urban tech problems and other challenges. Um, as we're working today with partners, we're trying to put together a program that works with not only New York City, but other cities across the world, uh, academic institutions, corporations, and foundations. Uh, we have new lab partnerships of a variety of different types and sizes, and what we really want to be is a convening place for a lot of these corporations, cities, and others to work on best practices and collaboration. Uh, we've gotten a lot of press recently from the Wall Street Journal to Vanity Fair to TechCrunch, uh, but the real reason to go out and get the press is to try to attract the best entrepreneurs and the best partners. Um, the other criteria that we look for besides technologists who are at the top of their game working in these verticals is optimism. And I can't stress this enough. You know, we're in this very, very uh, tricky time where uh, AI could surpass human intelligence in the next 10 to 20 years, where robotics are actually taking jobs. So we're looking for companies that are creating products that make the city better and that hopefully make the world better. And that's a very strong lens to look for. We're a city of 8 million people. Um, we are a competitive place. It's very, very hard to launch startups in New York City, and it's even harder to launch hardware startups in New York City. So we want to be the best resource for these optimistic companies that are doing good work in the world. And uh, we, if you are a company that's trying to do that type of work and wants to be in New York, we're happy to greet you. And if you're a city that would like to collaborate, we'd love to meet with you as well. So we're in the uh, Smart City uh, Conference Expo Center. Uh, in the New York Pavilion, if anyone wants to come visit us. There's four of us there from New Lab, so thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, David. Uh, that now it's time for uh, the micro, and if you have any questions, you can send by the system that uh, Smart City Expo was creating, but in any case, uh, let me take advantage of uh, different questions. Uh, one of them is, uh, it's coming from Anonymous. I don't know if it's. <laughs> uh, is which tools can be used to motivate uh, citizens to innovate? Perhaps it's going to you, uh, the, the citizens. Uh, because at the end of the day, we have technology, we have the city, we have entrepreneurs, but we have also citizens. How can you include, uh, what's the way that you are including citizens in the process of innovation? And also not just like a beta testers, also like a actors like uh, agents of the uh, development of new activities so uh, i'll try to be short on that uh well uh this case uh, well there, there is a a uh, very known design technique which is a user-centered design and uh, involving your citizen well your user uh in the process uh, for validating the, and uh, studying that their needs and not actually creating services uh that uh, will tailor uh, be tailored by uh, these needs and involving these users into the process is one thing it's like involving them into validating and getting uh, requirements for your product. The other one is putting them to make these things and show them that, that it is possible to innovate together. So that project that I... Uh, yeah, yeah co-creation, exactly. Yeah. Uh, the project that I've shown here, uh, uh, Playtown, was uh, an attempt to, to do that. And uh, it's, it's uh, still an ongoing effort, but uh, you have to go after them. It was hard uh, in a culture that where you're not aware of this possibility. People didn't understand. The, the, in the first workshop, uh, they were asking the government about a lot of things, but they didn't get that they were the ones that were going to do these things. They, they were going to propose that. So it was hard it was a, 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 to change the mindset. So uh, the, it, it takes time. So uh, it needs the first effort. 
Okay, but at the end of the day, this is a wonderful opportunity. We have citizens in the city. They can be like an, uh, just watching what is happening in the city, or they can be part of this smart city. First, understanding the challenge of the city, understanding the challenge of the society, and involving them in the co-creation. I don't know if we want to add something. Uh, I'll just say in the case of our municipality, we went from government to government, making a digital revolution in the government, to government to citizen tools. And a lot of people, when they talk about smart cities, they talk about government to citizens tools. But the next step that we are in right now is really citizens to citizens. How can we as a government create technological tools that we don't have to manage and we don't have to be part of, but that makes the life better, better for the citizens? So an example is, uh, in a shared economy, if we create the platform for a certain neighborhood to have a better life because we give them a technological tool or we help enable a technological tool that makes their life better, we don't have to control what goes on there. We're happy if they're happy. Um, so I think that's where our government is going and many governments are going. If it's good for the residents, it's good for the government, and we don't have to control it or even be part of what's going on in the process. Okay, good, perfect. Uh, second question is about the economic and innovation. Uh, what do you think that in, uh, in the coming years will be the more interesting sectors that the cities will work? I don't know, uh, one is could be, yeah the cities, but in any case, please, David. Well, I mean, I, you know, I, if, I think the most interesting evidence of this conference is everybody's trying to do the same thing, right? So if you go to all the booths of all the cities and all the, everybody is trying to create an innovation hub in their city. And so I think that what will happen is some best practices will eventually emerge uh, in terms of how we can gather data from our citizens, how we can collaborate, how we can create open innovation. Um, we've seen already in the last five years, everyone was so worried about IP, no one would collaborate five years ago because they were protecting their ideas as if they were the most precious jewels on earth. Now we realize the ideas mean nothing without implementation. And so best practices, not only in terms of the uh, ideas themselves, but how we collaborate and how we implement across platforms is I think the most exciting thing that can happen from uh, groupings like this at a Smart Cities conference. Okay, uh, following this, this, I don't know if you want to add something about the new economies that we will have in the city, because at the end of the day, I suppose that at the end of the day, there are activities that are related with the cities. For instance, health is an industry of the cities or not. Uh, if we think only in an intra-hospital, in, in, inside the, the building of the hospital, it's perhaps in hands of the medical devices industry. But if you are working in e-health, it means that, as uh, Mr. Zhang was talking about, if the city can be a must be a platform for a healthy city, a place that we can live, a smart city can help us in the pollution, reducing the pollution, but also to uh, um, uh, deliver services in order to uh, increase the uh, quality of the life of the e-citizens, but... Uh, well, um, in, the, in this, I think, one, one of the things that David was mentioning, is open innovation, like many uh, huge companies, they, they, they see that they're not that fast in innovating, so they're starting to uh, do uh, open innovation as a way to uh, uh, be fast with a partner, like, uh, please help us uh, innovating. Uh, I think cities, they tend to do that also, uh, like problems like those, that you mentioned. Uh, if they're not capable of doing that, they can be mentors, partners, tutors on these uh, uh, attempt to uh, bring innovation uh, in a faster pace, uh, which is, uh, they're not gonna be uh, by, them, by themselves. They, they, they're gonna need the, the, the community to do that. Um, as everyone now is congregating in cities, not only in the developed world, but also the developing world. Um, the issue of space and the cost of living in the city is becoming a uh, question for cities everywhere around the world. And I think that at the end of the day, whatever technologies will make our lives cheaper in the city, cheaper in the sense of the money we spend, but also the time we spend on the road, and anything that we own that we have to spend in exchange for living in the city, that's where we will bring benefit in technology. I think that's what people care about most. If you can lower the price of living, if you can lower the price of housing, if you can lower the price of products, if you can lower the price of owning certain things. So that's the success of Uber, and that's the success of WeWork, and that's the success of, of, um, 
of, um, of Airbnb and all these things where essentially you don't have to own because you can't afford to own things anymore. Okay, good. Uh, let me ask you about, okay, we understand that the first mile of the global innovation start in the, at home, start in my city. If I don't do any innovation in my city, I don't have to go to Tel Aviv to sell something. It means that uh, the, co the local ecosystem must provide the elements that really can check the product, develop with the first customer, and apply and evaluate the application. But my question is, how to scale? Imagine that I arrive to a good solution, but how, are you, how do you think that we can help entrepreneurs to scale the solutions that they are doing in New York, in Retife, or in uh, Tel Aviv? Well, so uh, with New Lab, one of the issues that we're focusing on is what is really possible with hyper-localized manufacturing? So in terms of supply chain, as digital manufacturing increases in its efficacy and as 3D printing actually becomes something that can print products that people use instead of just landfill, uh, and that's happening in medical, it's happening in a whole series of different really, really interesting uh, uh, lines, how can you scale hyper-locally while sharing information, information and those techniques internationally? Right? And so that's, that's the beauty of these kind of hyper-localized communities working on particular products. What we talked about a little bit before is what cities can do to help companies innovate in the city is become almost a synthetic customer. We see products get developed in these incubators or in hackathons. We see these products get developed that are amazing solutions. But by the time the city can procure it and buy it, the company dies. So how can we create a customer base with the cities, almost like a synthetic customer that can not only give money or incubate or give a facility like New Lab or an innovation district, but how can we make it so that they can actually procure some of the products that are being developed in these innovation hubs so that it can scale and so that the companies don't die on the vine, right? First it was just the ideas people were trying to protect. Then it was actually productizing those ideas with real problems. The final one is distribution and scale. And the only way you can get to distribution and scale is to create a customer base that can actually buy the product before the company has to either get absorbed or, or dies on the vine. Okay. Do you want to add any, anything? Just uh, w one quick thing is uh, in order to scale, to other cities, you need to find the particularities of these cities. Perhaps as a first step, like they do with mobile applications, is to find a similar market or find a similar city yeah. to test that. Because with, uh, for instance, uh, many uh, apps are developed in Brazil, they first uh, tested in Colombia, which is a very cultural, uh, uh, it's, it's close culturally, uh, but uh, it's a smaller market. So w they validate this uh, and then they change uh, some of the, uh, uh, characteristics, features uh, of this application, then they release on the Brazilian market. So finding similar uh, cities, uh, the same solutions that are created for uh, European cities, perhaps they're not adequate for uh, yeah. Brazil. Yeah. For instance, uh, people are afraid of uh, using their cell phones, uh, uh, their smartphones in the bus stops because they, they can be robbed. Yeah. So uh, yeah. There, there, are, there are certain details that have, to, have to be have. thought okay. Good. Uh, the time is over, but you have 20 seconds. Yeah. Come visit us at the Tel Aviv Pavilion. We'd be happy to welcome you free beer for everybody. <laughs> okay. Good. Uh, thank you very much. As you know, we were starting in Shanghai uh, one hour ago. Uh, we we're talking about how they are using technology, not just for developing a better government, uh, also because they are connecting green and IT. All the challenges that they have in pollution, all the challenges they have in order to provide a good place for living. We, uh, after uh, Shanghai, we went uh, to Israel, uh, to uh, Tel Aviv, and we discovered how Israel is a startup nation, but also how the city to city and government to city and government to government, that's a very important issue, uh, they are improving on that. Also, after that, we went to uh, Recife, to Brazil, understanding that, uh, that the hackathons are a very good approach to understand the challenge of your city, of different cities, that they share the challenge and you can really scale not only locally and internationally. And David from New York uh, was talking about how the new lab is really a wonderful tool for developing the prototype and also for checking in front of the uh, real uh, customers. At the end of the day, we have a wonderful opportunity to uh, talk after our presentation. 
uh, remember that we have an invitation to Pudong, to Shanghai. After that, we have to go to Israel. Uh, perhaps we can go to Brazil, yes? And we can finish our party in uh, New York. Thank you very much, and very happy to be here.